investing um, in a restorative blue economy, uh, Sarah Sella Stanchu from Enviro Strat um, is a sustainability uh, director there. She works uh, with private sector and government organisations on sustainability solutions and integration of natural capital and ecosystem services um, in policy and business decisions. Her work examines performance measurement and disclosure and investment for impact. Welcome to the stage, Sarah Sella. Kia ora, everyone. Um, very happy to be here and very happy to see so many of you uh, that we haven't had the chance to actually meet in person for a while now. Um, thank you as well, uh, Julie and the team, for this amazing um, effort to bring us together. You know, three, uh, what is it, third time lucky. It did happen, and we can only be here because it's a whole team behind that make this, um, you know, enable things and enable us to come together. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, my name is Shara Selastanku. Um, I work for an organization called Envirostrat. We are one of the uh, research, uh, one of the organizations that have been uh, involved in research in this project. We are part of Theme 2.2. Uh, which was a colleague with uh, Niwa Drew here in the room. It's a whole team of us, a bit like Jason and um, John before me. It's a whole team that has been part of this research for a year and a half. Uh, some from well, within Envirostrat, some from Niwa. We also had outside collaborators, uh, Jason as well. So, you know, what, what I'm talking about and the insights that uh, we share in, in relation to, to the project really come from uh, a broad set of minds. Um, and now, let's see. Um, just a, a little bit in terms of what I try to cover today, and I'm really mindful of this, you know, the clock running. Uh, go a little bit through the research, but my focus will be primarily on what we took out as key insights, if you want. And we've had this, um, um, if you want, challenge of looking at the investment and finance side of things, which for Many of us coming from an environmental background perspective, like myself, I have an environmental management background. It's something that we are growing into. It's knowledge that we are building um, as we speak, sort of. Um, this is just a little bit, actually, let me turn around. A little bit about the project. Um, so we've, as most of the research challenges, we focused initially on basing, uh, building some of the foundational research, some of the knowledge, taking stock, really trying a lot to work with what's in place, but also not reinventing the wheel in terms of understanding investment fra frameworks, KPIs, tools that are being used, and so on. So really bringing a lot of that economics, biophysical research, and finance together to understand where we, stay or where we stand in terms of knowledge. And from there on, we started looking much closer at what we call the impact investment fra framework, recognizing that as a team and as with the research, what we're trying to achieve is really look at the pinnacle, if you want, of blue economy, which is not only how do we invest in greening sectors, which is something that, in fact, most of our work is about, right? We're really striving to get that balance between economic activity the impact on the environment and uh, social outcomes. But it was actually also this challenge of saying, as, as people, we've already extracted a lot from the environment, we've benefited a lot, we did a lot of damage. How can we channel finance and investment in recovery? So it wasn't, it was uh, ambitious in the sense that we looked at, can we actually make nat um, nature assets investable? Uh, so that's what has driven us in terms of the knowledge quest. Um, and with this one, um, the way we've done the research, a key part was actually to have lots of conversations with those that work in investment and finance from, from a wide range of perspectives. Anybody from private sector investment through to government, recognizing that in New Zealand and elsewhere is actually the government and by and large taxpayers that really invest in restoration, invest in the science that goes with ecosystem restoration and so on. So it's been really, uh, as researchers, it's been wonderful to be able to have this, uh, if you want, time with knowledge holders from an area that normally, traditionally, we haven't engaged with, and kind of soak up that experiment, uh, the, the views that they have. And what 
what we are trying with this slide, what, I'm, what we are trying to summarize is really to say that it's all about balance. Um, so to be successful, to attract investment, it really is about how do we manage uh, risks. Um, and by that, we mean risk in terms of certainty of investment, but also risk in terms of ecosystem restor restoration outcomes. With the impact that we're trying to achieve, and it's not just restoration ecological impact, we are talking about livelihoods and well-being because they're all connected. And then um, on the other hand, also recognizing the need for return. We talk to pension funds, we talk to green funds. All of them, they have a, a duty to return, to have a financial return on the capital that they manage. Therefore, it comes back to us to answer the question of what are those revenue models and how can we turn natural assets into a, an investable asset that can be monetized. Uh, it's a challenge because uh, we have to deal with um, climate change, which is such an overarching, if you want, pressure driver. Um, but we also look at, um, look at the fact that ecosystems don't recover within investment timeframes, right? So to demonstrate that we've achieved um, ecological restoration outcomes, it can take five, 10 years, it can take longer in some cases. And in a lot of uh, instances, we have significant uncertainties that we are dealing with it from a biophysical perspective and, and so on. So how do we actually bring that into an investment framework? That's the sort of stuff, uh, and you know, investors that have uh, operate on a eight year, 10 year time frame. Some of them may even want to get out of an investment within five years. That's not how we operate in terms of ecological, um, ecological transformation and ecological outcomes. So it's, it's, it's uh, operating within knowledge spheres and trying to balance this interest is what the challenge really uh, um, we have to uh, face too. And within that is this idea of trade-offs. I mean, we've been through quite massive um, you know, climate events for the last two months. Um, as environmental practitioners, researchers, and so on, we like to talk for a long time about the win-win-win. Uh, when we are now in this reality, in fact, that there isn't necessarily a win-win-win, and we have to face up to trade-offs, we have to face up to losses that we cannot avoid. In some cases, because we delayed action in terms of protecting the ecosystem, building climate resilience, and so on. In some cases, it's because that's a reality. If we want, as humans, to extract more value from the environment, if we don't return that, don't apply reciprocity, then there is a little bit of one winning and the other one losing. So the concept of trade-off is there on the table. Um, very quickly on the demand and supply. Uh, another insight from us in this space is that finance and restoration, we are not totally disjointed communities of practice, but you know we don't have aligned languages, and it's a lot, it's a significant mind shift to accept that we have to invest, uh, to recognize investment in restoration as if it was an economic activity. It requires a mind change for us, those that deal with environmental management, with uh, ecology, with ecosystems, and so on. On the other hand, the providers of capital, they, are, will have to go through some shift in terms of how they look at things. Um, is it realistic to accept, to expect 12%, 10%, 15% return on investment if it is about ecological restoration or ecological outcomes? Maybe not. Maybe that reality of expectations has to also adjust on the capital provision because we have to accept that we need to internalize externalities, right? Likewise, we as those that understand how ecosystem recovery happens and what needs to happen and so on, we have to think beyond the ecological indicators to really think, well, what's the revenue model behind this recovery? What type of businesses? What type of governance and so on? So that's when, you know, it's a little bit learning by doing in, the, in this space. Um, where we've landed in terms of um, the impact investment pro, um, framework, it's rather what I would say, it's more like an impact investment frame, uh, process. You start from that high level of actually understanding within an ecosystem space, within a physical boundary that, you know, if it's Hauraki Gulf or it's uh, Fangare Harbor or if it is, you know, Akaroa coastline. 
um, we have that, uh, that area that is uh, defined, and there are aspirations of the people who live there, of the Iwi, of the Manafenua, um, for what that place they would like to see to. That's where we normally start in this process of actually identifying impact uh, investment opportunities. And from there on, we go through the classical, you know, what are the conditions and what are the trends in natural capital ecosystems? What's, hap what's happening on the social side of things? What is, what's happening with the uh, produced capital? You know, the boats that we are all talking about, how they need the gear upgrade and they need to put the, the new technology around monitoring. So taking stock of all of that, it's a critical, if you want, baseline establishment. And it's important in relation to how we connect that to the aspirations on, from there on, how do we define opportunities. Um, and this is, you know, from there on, it's about packaging implementation uh, opportunities and ideas in a way that can be, um, you know, that they can be pitched to those that have got the capital and the resources. And what I'm trying here is really make these ideas um, tangible for you. Imagine that this is, um, you know, Hauraki Golf, for example. It's a broad ecosystem. To really achieve the aspirations, it's not about a single intervention, right? It's about many things that need to happen, not necessarily simultaneously, but in time to really support the ecosystem recovery, to, to meet those aspirations that we all have, to see after the well-being um, uh, of the ecosystem as well as the people. And you can see here, uh, you know, trying to uh, provide a bit of a, I don't know, a schematic idea. You can retire some of the fishing quota, whether it's scallops and so on. We can have restoration of um, tidal wetlands happening on the borderline. We can have you know, multicultural aquaculture, and there are a number of uh, initiatives in this space, including the work that is um, you know, being now um, progressed in seaweed space. So all of these things are initiatives that have got different risk return profile. They deliver different environmental outcomes if they are successful, but they also require different type of capital at times, and there are different returns. Some of them do not have financial return. This is the idea why we need larger scale, and with the, what we've learned through this research is to focus at that larger ecosystem scale because that's where we can aggregate idea, uh, opportunities and projects and initiatives with different profiles in terms of return. And through that, you know, hopefully build that larger investment and finance case um, to support a, an ecosystem um, um, improvement. What another key insight that we've had and really uh, great conversations with a number of finance players in New Zealand but also overseas is around this need of actually being able to activate new revenue streams. It's very simple in some ways to say that. It really is not that simple to do in reality. Uh, in New Zealand, we have a, a, an experience with one environmental, if you want, uh, revenue streams and that is the carbon markets. And we all know that there are positives and negatives to that. Beyond that, we've had experience with some nutrient interventions, primarily taxpayer funded and so on, but we don't have significant environmental markets. We don't have clarity around how payment for ecosystem services should truly happen and how some of these externalities and the question of who pays and who benefits needs to come to the forefront. It is a job for us to kind of come up with these ideas. What are the new revenue streams? What are the revenue streams of the future so that we can make the case with the super fund to invest a lot more in ecosystem protection in New Zealand and you know, not look for ideas elsewhere. It's, it's a challenge for all of us to come up with these ideas. And you can see here you know, some of the, the ideas that came through research. Some of them, I would say, are more uh, appropriate and more, uh, have more potential in New Zealand uh, context than, than others. What's needed to unlock investment? We have lots of challenges, and I'm not going to go through that. There is a summary there. I've, I've covered them. But it's also about actually looking at the future, what an enabling environment into the future looks like. And what our research shows and the conversations we've had is that, in fact, the government has a much larger role to play even in attracting private capital. So enabling, creating the conditions to enable finan financial flow into ecosystem and natural asset. That's something that the government has to, 
uh, has to step up beyond what they are currently doing. Uh, and, and, you know, I wouldn't want to underplay that, but creating environmental markets, willingness to pay for environmental services, often the government tends to have that role in setting up the right context for these ideas uh, to happen. They are not the only player, for sure, but it, it, it was a continuous theme, if you want, through our research, you know, the willingness to pay and how the government needs to create the conditions for that, including around incentives, including around making it easy to, you know, standardization, the environmental standards and all that work, it's useful happening at the moment, but it's also about going um, beyond that. Um, and here it is, you know, we're trying to, to look through the research and all the conversations we've had, including our prototyping, if you want, testing of the impact investment framework in the um, Hauraki Gulf, um, the variety of roles and actors within the blue economy and restorative economies. Any, anyone from those that provide the catalytic, if you want, um, uh, catalyst capital through to uh, the knowledge base, which is where us, the science, the research plays a key role, but also the uh, regulatory environment. And we've heard a lot about governance challenges and so on. Um, and I've just run out of time, but I cannot not finish a presentation like this without talking about, you know, a little bit of a, what's been a focus for our team, which is around natural capital accounting. You know, we need to be able to do that, to do it better. We need to bring to bear some of our science around um, accounting for natural capital and social capital to underpin these cases. Um, and you know, this is just a, a schematic way to say it can be done, it, it's important in terms of inv investment, business case development, but also accountability. And it is something for us uh, working on biophysical side of things to actually grapple with, but also connect with the, with the economics. And um, it's a way forward. Um, for us. Thank you very much. I don't know about it.